morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, happy week after Easter. Um, as you can see, Pastor Kim is not with us today. Um, she's taking a little break after the busy Lenten Easter season. Um, so that's nice. I think she is visiting family. So um, she'll be back next week. A um, few announcements looking here. It looks like there's going to be a, maybe a new adult Bible study starting Mondays at 6 o'clock, or at least a new um, study going. Um, the blood drive is coming up on April 24th. Um, we're going to have a highway cleanup on May 7th at 5 o'clock. Um, Let's see, that's the main ones, I guess. I'll let you look at those. Um, uh, Skipper mentioned there's gonna be a memorial uh, meeting right after church, is that correct? Okay, downstairs, I'm assuming, in the fellowship. Um, and Bill is here alone this morning. Do you wanna explain? <laughs> Thank you, Kevin, for the opportunity. I thought it'd be easier to make this announcement Babs had a bad fall and she broke her leg. Oh, so she's in St. Luke's. Uh, we're doing the pain management. It is not going to require surgery. It's a, it's a fracture, but not uh, separated. Uh, and we probably will spend some time in uh, that lake shore in a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. I'll keep you posted. Thank you for your prayers. She's in room 508 at St. Luke's. So, yeah, sorry to hear that, but we'll keep her in our prayers. Um, does anybody else have any other announcements? Okay, we begin our service then. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Our gathering hymn is in the book, the Red Book, uh, 363.
God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. God of second chances and God of new life, we have spent our days wandering. Like Peter, we have milled about through nearly every state of faith. We have had courageous days and convicted days, learning days and questioning days. We have had days where we run to you, days for diving out of the boat, days for deep joy, and days where the pain of the world feels too close to bear. So as we bring our wandering hearts to you, we ask that you draw us in, allowing this story to spark something new in us. Allow the story of grace to give us pause and pull us in. We are listening. Amen.
everything that they owned was held in common. With great power, the apostles gave their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and with great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as owned lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold. They laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm is from 133, verse 1. How good and how pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. It is like fine oil on the head, flowing down upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron, flowing down upon the flower of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon flowing down upon the hills of Zion, for there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life evermore. The second reading is from 1 John, first starting with verse 1. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, and what we have looked at and touched with our hands. Concerning the word of life, this life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in dark darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is atoning sacrifice for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to John uh, 2, 11 through 19, 21, 1 through 19. Glory to you, O Lord. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Then they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the, the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, have you no fish? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes for he was naked and jumped into the sea. By the, but the other disciples came in the boat dragging the net full of fish for they were not far from land, 
only about 100 yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now the disciple dared, not, now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And, and he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and, and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not want, wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, Follow me, the Gospel of the Lord. <coughs> Praise to you, Lord Christ. Our seasonal lectionary for the first Sunday after Easter uh, focuses on Jesus' resurrection appearances to his close followers. Today's Gospel scripture from John is about a number of things. It is about revealing Jesus reveals himself to the disciples as living again. In last year's reading for this week, the revealing was especially about Jesus showing the signs of his crucifixion scars. Jesus had previously appeared to the larger group when Thomas wasn't present. However, the other disciples also probably needed more than a single resurrection experience, uh, a hard one which was a hard uh, with Jesus to solidify to them what had happened. This post-Easter experience was a hard one for them to get their heads around, and we wouldn't blame them for that. This year, our gospel about Jesus' post-resurrection revelation is to part of the group of disciples as they gather to go fishing. Thomas again was present, but this time Jesus especially focused on Peter, particularly Jesus giving Peter his commission to lead the disciples' new mission to share, to share Jesus' message widely. Other themes beyond re revelation in these stories are, of course, doubt, which led to the revealing and recognition of Jesus by Thomas, and that revealing led to hope once the disciples had gotten past the shock and their paralysis coming from fear, and that hope led to action as the disciples obeyed Jesus' directive to take his message of the new kingdom out to the world surrounding them. This was about a new way of living, about loving and serving our neighbor as never before. As mentioned last year, the doubter Thomas seems to have taken the message the farthest, based on what can be deciphered from somewhat limited historical records of the disciples after Jesus' ascension. Thomas was moved to incredible action, and Peter did become the most prominent disciple and leader of the new church. So again, Doubt and paralysis are revealing, then hope and encouragement and action on a new mission. Today's second lesson emphasizes also unity and, and the fellowship that was among the disciples. Today I'm going to pivot uh, to another thing on the calendar at this time of the year, uh, that being Earth Day, uh, which is coming up on April 22nd, or what some people are now calling Earth Month. Some of us think every day is Earth Day. Um, and I don't know if you saw, yesterday was the um, Northeast Minnesota Synod Eco-Faith uh, Annual Summit, 
Um, so this is a, a little bit of a, a focus on that as well. But I think there are a lot of parallel themes to what is happening on our earth right now and how we have and are responding to it. And these stories of Jesus, uh, revelations of himself and the effect on the disciples. In Jesus' day, the Jews faced great challenges as a suppressed people. And the early Christians too faced daunting challenges in their mission in the midst of extremely powerful opposition. This miraculous earth faces major challenges in our time, and I'm speaking of the climate changes that are occurring, the negative effects those climate changes are having. In many ways, these times seem dark, like, like the way it must have seemed dark to the disciples those three days following Jesus' crucifixion. We hear in the story that the disciples are holed up in a state of paralysis, uncertain of the path to take moving forward. A few years ago, following the COP25 international governmental meeting on climate issues, there were feelings that paralysis had set in as governments feared to change the status quo in their countries. Churches responded. The Pope called for a need of ecological conversion. The Lutheran World Federation called the impact of climate change one of the most critical threats to human life and nature, especially affecting the poor and vulnerable and stress the call for immediate action. The World Federation of Churches said the time for debate and dis disputation of established scientific facts is over. The time for action is swiftly passing. The Episcopal Church's representative said, climate change is a symptom not just of what is happening to the physical world, but of overconsumption, selfishness, and apathy. Part of the solution lies with faith leaders who can mobilize their communities through the teachings and actions required to generate this change. Revelations or signs in nature are telling us that things are not okay. Just this past week, I have heard numerous stories about these revelations, signs in the natural world that serious trouble is brewing. One story is that researchers have found that humpback whales in the Pacific Ocean which migrate back and forth between the Alaskan coast and the Hawaiian Islands have suffered between 20 and 30% population loss since 2012 due to warming of waters in the Pacific, which has reduced the prey that humpbacks feed on. I've had the good fortune of seeing these whales in Hawaii, even going out on a boat to observe them. One went right under the boat, just a few feet below the surface. It was an astonishing sight. Also in the oceans, large amounts of the coral reefs are dying, experience a process called bleaching. Between 1995 and 2017, 50% of the coral in the Great Barrier Reef has died. I have not had the experience of being underwater to experience that natural wonder, but I have snorkeled the coral reefs again in Hawaii, and that is another truly astounding experience. It is a whole nother world there, carrying on beautifully without our management all these millennia. And now it is imperiled. Hopefully we will not let such amazing, phenomenal features of God's creation disappear on our watch. Could these revelations and signs that we hear, and, and hear about and see, just like what happened to Thomas, be a prompting from God to rise to the occasion and take action to correct past ways of living and move to a new way of living that expands our realization of who our neighbors are. Could our neighbors include humpback whales of the Pacific or the phenomenally colored and widely varied fishes, types of fishes that live amongst the corals and are dependent on the coral communities for their food? And changes in the environment are not just happening a long distance from our home. Precipitation events in Minnesota are becoming more extreme. In Duluth, we experienced a very damaging storm in 2012 that literally ripped up the streets in Duluth. We've experienced storms recently that are, have battered our Lake Superior shoreline and caused extensive damage and erosion. Our beloved Lake Walk in Duluth has been extensively damaged twice in the past 10 years, requiring expensive repairs and new fortification to it from similar storms. There have been unprecedented wildfires in many locations, including Canada, 
We remember the many smoky days with unhealthy air that we had to endure last summer due to these extensive fires. We have had some recent extreme wind events that have caused amazing damage to our forest lands. There was the big blowdown in the Boundary Waters. There have been more than one of these events in western Wisconsin near our border, and there have been two really substantial ones in the Brainerd Lakes area, one of which I experienced firsthand at the home that I owned there when I was working in Brainerd, where huge numbers of big trees were blown down, including a bunch in my neighborhood and a large one in my yard. It took almost a year to recover from that damage. And of course, for Minnesotans, could there be a bigger sign than a winter that never really happened? No person alive today has lived through a winter like this. There were positives, the driving was easy, but there will be substantial negatives, as, such as uh, good winter survival of invasive pests like the emerald ash borer, which in our normal deep cold stints can suffer a lot of mortality. And it is not just our natural neighbors that are suffering from the changes that we've created on our planet. Economic pain and eco economic loss is mounting substantially for humans. In recent years and months, it is getting extremely difficult to afford or even obtain homeowners insurance in some places of our country. Just again this week, I heard about another insurance company discontinuing to offer home insurance in Louisiana. Similar problems are occurring in Florida and California, locations that have taken particular brunt of extreme weather with massive property damage. Water resources in the western U.S. experienced extreme shortages last year as reservoirs on the Colorado River dropped drastically. Salt Lake uh, in Utah shrunk and there were concerns that dust from the lake bed, which has natu natural mineral toxins, could endanger the citizens of Salt Lake City. And one particular photo in an article really caught my attention. It was an aerial photo from above a dry area with very long linear rows of something that looked like piles of something. And, and uh, the caption said that these were uh, pecan or almond trees in what was a California plantation that had been cut down because they require more water than the farmer is able to provide them. This farmer was forced to give up. So there are large economic issues occurring that are wreaking havoc on individual human lives worldwide. What is our motivation to move from doubt or paralyzation to the position that Thomas and the disciples were in to a recognition of the signs that are presenting before us? the revelations we are seeing in our weather, and to move forward in a new way, altering our lives like the disciples did, to find a new realization and calling to love our neighbors, both our fellow humans, as well as our neighbors, the humpback whales, the vibrant little coral uh, reef inhabitants, um, and our forests. For me, the old, perhaps familiar hymn comes to mind, this is my father's world, it's not our world. We are also seeing signs of hope. I just heard again this week that the uh, energy process called fusion um, has made some progress this week. Fusion is the opposite of nuclear energy. It requires a very large amount of energy to cause fusion to happen, but when it does, it releases an amazing amount of completely clean energy with zero harmful waste. There's a lot of effort going on into new technology and engineering. Thursday, I read about a very different design of wind turbines that has spiral blades that spin in a much more compact area than current models with their huge blades. Technology and manufacturing advances have brought down the cost of several of the types of green energy production. In today's second reading, we hear about how the disciples were gathered in, a com gathered in a community that was very unified. Conquering our climate challenges is gonna require at least a fair amount of uni unified effort. There have been and are lots of negotiations happening among international governments. Progress tends to break down if one group starts to think another group is not living up to their responsibilities. With our directive to, from Jesus to love our neighbor, with everyone being included as our neighbor, 
Christians can bring this, under, bring this understanding to the discussions that are occurring amongst groups and countries as they try to unite in mission to accomplish the necessary goals for the health of the planet. I won't go deeply into all of the ways we each can individually participate in solving the climate crisis, but there are many, and information abounds. Uh, improving the ener energy efficiency of our homes with new improved windows, choosing energy efficient appliances when they need replacing, driving less, purchasing a hybrid or a full electric vehicle, altering the things we eat, perhaps installing new energy technology like solar or a heat pump, planting a tree or planting numerous trees. One place that I would suggest looking is the website of Lutherans Restoring Creation. From that website on the background of this ELCA network, it says Lutherans Restoring Creation has arisen out of a long Lutheran tradition of reflection and action uh, addressing environmental concerns from the perspective of our faith and theology. Do we even have uh, perhaps a special role to play in this issue as Christians? As the Apostle Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans in, verses eight, uh, in chapter 8, verses 19 through 21, for creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. That's us. For the creation has been subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its enslavement to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It sure sounds that we, as children of God, are meant to play a part in this hoped-for beautiful state of creation. As Jesus revealed, uh, as Jesus revealed his resurrection, resurrected self to the apostles, creating hope in them, here we then reveal ourselves uh, as, God, as being God's children to creation with the seeming implication that in that verse that the non-human world will be treated with love because we are the children of God. The challenge before us may seem daunting, but so is the task of evangelizing the world with such a small initial group of Christ's followers in the face of persecution by an immensely powerful controlling Roman Empire. And yet, here we are, 2,000 years later, worshiping in our church this morning. We don't stop doing our regular church missions, but we, but we add to them with this assignment. We recognize that our natural world is also our neighbor that we treat with love. There is another arena in which we, uh, this is another arena which we can witness to our faith amongst others in being leaders leaders of the stewardship role we have been given by our creator. The ELCA has a place on its website concerning Earth Day celebration. It says, our tradition offers many glimpses of hope triumphant over despair. When Martin Luther was asked what he would do if the world were to end tomorrow, he reportedly answered, I would plant an apple tree today. When we face today's crisis, we do not despair, we act. Acknowledging our stewardship responsibilities to the non-human world is a way we can help bring healing to our historically contentious relationships with our native neighbors. And we can learn from them too. I have been reading a book titled Braiding Sweetgrass by Native American author Robin Wall Kimmerer, an environmental biology professor at the State University of New York. In her book, she cites a recitation that the Onondaga Indians who live in the Northeastern United States have their children start each day with at school. I think it is one that we can learn from. It is known as the Thanksgiving Address, or more accurately in their language, the words that come before all else. She notes that this ancient statement puts gratitude as the first priority. I will quote some of it uh, to close my sermon. In it, there are words of hope, revelations, calls to responsibility and stewardship, a strong recognition of our dependence on the natural world, and a unity among people. To begin, today we have gathered, and when we look upon the faces around us, we see the cycles of life continue. 
We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and with all living things. So now let us bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst, for providing strength and nurturing life for all beings. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans, snow and ice. We are grateful that the waters are still here and meeting their responsibility to the rest of creation. Can we agree the water is important to our lives and bring our minds together as one to send greetings and thanks to the water? Now our minds are one. Now we turn to the vast fields of plant life. As far as the eye can see, the plants grow, working many wonders. They sustain many life forms. With our minds gathered together, we give thanks and look forward to seeing plant life for many generations to come. Now our minds are one. We gather our minds to greet and thank the enlightened teachers who have come throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as people. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. And I'll just interject here. Doesn't this stanza sound remarkably similar to our second reading today? We now turn our thoughts to the creator or great spirit and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on Mother Earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the Creator. Now our minds are one. And to that I will say amen. We continue with hymn 386.
the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under the conscious power, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He descended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Please share the peace with your neighbors. We continue with the prayers of the people. Rejoicing that Jesus is risen and love has triumphed over fear, let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news. Your church cries out, O God, and you listen. As you draw near to the disciples, draw near to us this day. Breathe on us your Holy Spirit, that our faith is renewed and we witness to your love. God, in your grace, we are pray. Your creation cries out, O oh God, and you listen. Nurture trees, crops, bell, wildflowers, and all glory things. Guide farmers, gardeners, arborists, and others who tend the soil and nurture the plants into life. God of grace, we are pray. Your world cries out, O oh God, and you listen. Guide police, firefighters, paramedics, and other first responders to work for the well-being of the communities and the dignity of every person, that no one may need to live in fear. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your children cry out, O oh God, and you listen. Hear your people crying out for justice, for an end to racism and other oppression and for a world where all are fed and safe. We pray for all who cry out in suffering or pain. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your congregations cry out, O oh God, and you listen. Renew pastors, deacons, musicians, and other staff, administrators, and volunteers who facilitated Holy Week and Easter worship. Open our hearts to discern where God calls each of us to serve. God of grace, hear our prayer. Accept our gratitude, O God, for our lives of those who now rest in you. Grant us your peace amid our fears. God of grace, hear our prayer. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. 
Form us to be your witnesses in the world through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. Amen. Um, today we're going to be having uh, communion at the altar here. Um, if anyone wants to stay in the pew, um, just catch the attention of uh, an usher and they can bring uh, 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 the communion uh, to your place. The Lord be with you. And also and with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, for the glorious resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ, the true Paschal Lamb who gave himself to take away our sin, who in dying has destroyed death and in rising has brought us to eternal life. And so with Mary Magdalene and Peter and all the witnesses of the resurrection, with earth and sea and all their creatures, and with angels and archangels, cherubim and seraphim, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy name is the kingdom. Bread for the journey, a feast for hungry hearts. Come.
The risen Christ is made known to us in the breaking of the bread. Come and eat at God's table. Beloved wanderer, as you leave this place, may you carry your curious heart on your sleeve. May you look for God in every face. May you find the courage to get out of the boat, to run to the tomb, and to speak of your faith. And when the world falls apart, may you hear God's voice deep within saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. You are called, you are blessed. In both your ups and downs, you always belong to God. Go now in peace, go trusting the good news. Our sending hymn is number 815. Hallelujah, go in peace, rejoice and be glad. Thanks be to God.